Oh man, I love that. Good night. That's, you know, it's just amazing how, how songs and music the Lord uses to just touch your life. You know what? And I know you know this because I've, I've said it to you before many times, I'm sure, about the book of Psalms is just a book of songs. That's what Psalms are, are songs that, um, that David wrote, most of them. He didn't write all of the Psalms. But these were, were songs that were written um, in some very stressful and difficult times. And the words have been preserved in the, in the book of Psalms. Those are the words that they use. The only thing that we've lost is the melody. And I think it's because God intends for us to make our own melody. Every generation has its own melodies that it sings. <clears throat> the words may stay the same, but the melodies change because God is a creative God and he has created us to be creative. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, this may be beside the point, but um, you know, we, we humans um, appreciate uh, creativity and we, we honor and we reward people who create things or do things that others can't do with music or athletics or money or whatever it might be. Uh, we just admire creative life because God has created us. Our enemy is not creative. He does not create anything. He uses the same methods all the time to take advantage of us, but our God is a creative God and God has created us to be creative beings. So anyway, there you go. That doesn't really have anything to do with the message today, but, but <clears throat> just kind of, kind of get you warmed up a little bit, you know. I kind of got to get my juices flowing and everything. I'm going to mention this to you and, um, and we're going to um, be doing this in the, in the weeks to come. Uh, Tanya, Tanya and I, uh, well, I'm going to be preaching some messages on, uh, on the more, most, what, what I consider to be the most important things that the scripture has to say about many areas of our life. The Bible is filled with teachings, w words, examples, encouragements, warnings about many areas of life, all of the areas of our life, our mind, our mouth, what we say, our relationships, you know, what God's purpose is in our life, all of those things. This Bible's filled with verses. And if you've ever done this in a, especially now because you can do it electronically, uh, in a concordance, you just, you know, type in the word mind and just see how many verses in the Bible have something to say about the mind. Well, would it help you if I could narrow it down for you and give you the 10 greatest things that God says about the mind and about what he wants, how we please him, what our mind is to be? I mean, would that be helpful for you? Well, if it would, that's what I'm gonna be doing over the next, uh, you know, probably the next three months, two or three months, um, and I'm gonna take different areas of, of our lives that are very vital to us and just bring you the top 10 things that God says, synthesize some and, and then the greatest things. And I promise you that uh, it'll change your life. If you want your life to change, you know, a lot of times people talk about relevance. They want everything to be relevant. They want the messages to be relevant, the music to be relevant. Well, what are they talking about? They're talking about they want it to do something to affect them, that they want it to be about something that makes a difference in their life. And, and they can carry out of here and it matters. And, and so this will be the most relevant thing, thing that you can find because it's certainly about life. And so we're gonna be doing that over the next <clears throat> three months or so. Today I wanna to sh share with you just a simple message that has a few points about prayer. It's really a message about prayer. I, I call it, this ain't nothing but some bread. And I know you've heard that phrase before because uh, Lawrence and Bell, Lawrence, that was his favorite phrase. I, would, I said it years ago. I mean, way back, like 2007 or something. And he never forgot it. I, that, that became his favorite phrase because anytime anything happened in his life that was difficult or hard, are hard to understand, he would just say, oh, pastor, this ain't nothing but some bread. 
And he would say that. I mean, and, and he was so faithful with that. He still says it, as a matter of fact. And um, I know, you know, they watch, Bev and Lawrence watch. They've kind of gotten uh, physically uh, hindered in a lot of ways. And of course, COVID and all these things. But they still love you guys. I see them all the time. And, um, and they miss you and love you. And wish they could be here. And maybe someday they'll be able to come back. But anyway, uh, Lawrence... He loved that phrase. This ain't nothing but some bread. And, but this is really what this, what this is about. is about prayer. Because, uh, you know, it's important for everyone. I started just to say for, for ministry. But if, you, if I say it's important for ministry, then you're think, you think that I'm just talking to preachers and, and worship leaders and stuff like that. But all of us have a ministry in life, but, but, but it's important to everything in life, no matter what business you're involved in or what endeavor of life you know, you're following. Um, even if it's, if, if, if it's your recreation, if it's something that you enjoy, it's really nice to have a mentor that, can, that you can work with and learn from and go behind the scenes you know, and see how it really is. And, uh, and, and they can teach you some things as they go. Well, you know, in the scripture, uh, Paul had, uh, Timothy had his Paul, uh, Elisha had Elijah, um, Joshua had Moses. I mean, you know, there are just many examples of a mentor-mentee relationship where <clears throat> the mentor taught the, the younger one all about what's involved and how to do this. Well, the disciples had it best of all because 12 guys for three years got to follow Jesus around everywhere he went. Now, wouldn't you like to have that opportunity to just, I mean, like walk into the cafe out here and just sit down and, and eat a biscuit with Jesus. I mean, just talk with him and see, or, and see somebody come in limping and, and walk out healed, you know, or, or go to the hospital with Jesus. Say, hey, let's Jesus, let's go down to the hospital. I, I got a friend I need to see and just have Jesus go with you and you just go in and walk down the halls bring you a little flashlight with you because as he walks down the hall, he wouldn't even have to say anything. You could just shine the light, you know, and his shadow would hit somebody. And boom, man, they'd walk out of the hospital. That'd be a wonderful thing to be able to walk with Jesus and to see everything that Jesus did and hear everything that Jesus did. And there were 12 guys that got that opportunity for three years of their life that everywhere Jesus went, they went with him. Everything he said, they heard. Every miracle he did, they saw what happened. They saw what happened before it, what happened after it. When Jesus would go away, you know, and pray, uh, they would be able to hear what him say things to the Father. Uh, that would just be a tre tremendous thing to be able to hear Jesus like that and to have that wonderful opportunity that the disciples had. Well, the disciples began, I'm sure, to notice things in Jesus' life that they would love to have in their life. And I'm sure they began to notice that before anything tremendous happened, before any of these, some of these greatest miracles and, and, and events that you remember, you know, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on water, uh, speaking to the winds and the waves, healing the cripple folks, uh, opening blind eyes. You know, before any of that happened, I'm sure they began to notice that right before that, somehow Jesus would always disappear away from them. And they would find him in some solitary place praying. And so they began to say to Jesus, Jesus, can you teach us to do that? Look, we want to we wanna know what you know so we can be what you are so we can do what you do. So Jesus, can you teach us how to do all these great things that you're just constantly doing? And if you read in the scripture and know anything about what Jesus did next, you'll know that Jesus didn't say, well, guys, it's easy. Um, let's get you in a good school that can teach you stuff like this. He didn't even say, you know, you need a seminary. You need to go to seminary. Or get in a good church, guys. You know, get in one of these uh, big show churches that can have all these performances going on. And you can do wonderful. No, what did Jesus do? Well, here's what Jesus did. This is Matthew chapter six. They asked him, how can we do what you do? And we want to know what you do when you pray. Because obviously, 
Whatever you do when you pray matters when you perform. In other words, public success, let's just say, is predicated on private prayer. That Jesus went and prayed and then whatever he did out here was totally uh, made possible because of what he did back there. So let's see what he tells them. And it, it just a little simple thoughts, instructions here. You've heard this prayer. You've said it a bunch of times. Uh, it's probably the most often repeated prayer or Bible verse, verses in the world. I know no, everybody knows uh, Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You hear it every funeral, every place. I know uh, for God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son. But this one right here, these words right here are spoken by people that don't even know the Lord at all. I mean, these are just, these are just spoken all the time, and here they are. And Jesus says in verse five of Matthew six, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the, street cor and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. I mean, are you ready for some bread? <laughs> some bread. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. And so Jesus teaches them, here's, here's, what you, th here's the mindset you need to have when you are talking to your heavenly father. This is what you need to believe and, and this is what you need uh, to understand and, and do as you pray. Not just, not just some simple practice like separate yourself, go into a closet somewhere, shut the door. I mean, that, that's not the instruction. The instruction is what's happening here. What, what's happening here uh, when you talk to your father and what, what you need to understand about this so that it can encourage you to just simply Go before him and be what you are and not be, try to be anything else but that. And don't be ashamed or shy or bashful about it because this is what God wants. So let me give you just six simple instructions that Jesus gives um, about how to pray. When they ask him, how do we pray? He said, here's how you do it. Number one instruction, don't be like hypocrites. Jesus said, you know, hey, don't be like the heathens are when you pray. Well, Jesus, how do hypocrites pray? Well, the first thing they do is that they, they exalt themselves. I mean, they're very pious and very spiritual and very, you know, very, very uh, showy about what they do. And they get on the street corners and they say, hey, everybody, can I have your attention? I'm about to pray over here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and God's going to hear the prayer. I mean, just call attention to themselves. And they want people to see them and people to think, man, what a spiritual giant he is. And they, and they pray these big flowery things with a bunch of words in them uh, because they somehow think that, man, I'm gonna impress God with these big words I'm speaking and, 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 and he'll do what I'm asking because you know, God can't resist this big, wonderful language that I have. Uh, Back when, back when I used to be in the ministry, back, back in, in, my, in my years back, I've been involved a lot of times with many preachers. And I'm not trying to be condemning about preachers because I are one. 
And, you know, I, I, we're all human, believe it or not. I mean, I know sometimes people think, you know, we live on Marshmallow Lane and, you know, honey falls out of our mouth and you know, fire from our eyes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you, you really don't think a lot of times about being a human as a preacher, but believe me, they, they very much are. And, uh, and I have, this is the kind of thing uh, I think about when I read that, don't be like the heathens do who say a bunch of words and they try to put on a performance and you know, impress everybody with who they are and what they know. Every, I think about this kind of stuff when I read those verses. Uh, there have been times, honestly, we'd be a group of us, would be preachers, would just be laughing, joking, uh, having fun, joyful, you know, just a lightheartedness and stuff about that. And somebody say, well, okay, I guess it's time to start the meeting, guys. All right, uh, uh, Brother Bob, would, uh, would you pray for us? Now, Brother Bob's been laughing and joking and playing around and been funny and lighthearted and all of that kind of stuff. But when Brother Bob gets called on to pray, it's kind of like, <clears throat> yeah, oh, uh, our Father... Who, who sitteth on the throne above the sapphire seal of heaven, looking down on our empty humanity. We ask thee and thou providence to... It, you've heard it, right? You've heard stuff like that. I mean, it's like, you want to go, you, you want to go, wow, <laughs> you are really impressive. I mean, I've actually heard people seriously uh, in church. I mean, I, I've pastored for 50 years. So I've been in many churches and I've been in revivals, all that kind of stuff, all kind of meetings. And honestly, there are some people that people call on to pray simply because they love the performance. I mean, it's just, it's like, okay, uh, we're gonna have the message now, but we're gonna have brother so-and-so pray because that's gonna be our message today. You know, it's just like a sermon or something. And it's just like, wow, that Jesus said, Jesus said, look, 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 look. Don't, don't do that. Don't be like the heathens when you pray. Don't mess around like that. Because, he says, I got to clue you in on one thing. God already knows what you need before you even ask him for it. So when you're talking to him, you're talking to someone who knows already before you even voice something exactly what it is that you need. And so Jesus says, when you go to him, you just come to him and you say, Father, you know, I know that you know I need and I know you know things that I need that I don't even know that I need. So all I'm doing right now is I'm just coming to you and praying in agreement with whatever it is that you have because you know what I need and I know that all things are possible through you and I know that you'll bless my life and I mean, I'm just coming to you, just agreeing with what you want for my life. And you just go to him and you, just, and you talk to him and, and, and be yourself. Don't try to be something that you're not because God knows you. Have you ever found yourself trying to talk God into something? Have you ever, um, I guarantee you've done this. You've thought before, okay, how can I say this to God? You know, and you're trying to think of a way to put it. And I'm thinking, he already knows. He knows what I'm thinking. He knows what's going on. He knows all of that. And Jesus said, look, so don't worry about all of that uh, stuff that you, that you think are gonna impress God because God already knows you and he knows everything you need. So don't try to impress God. So the disciples saw that. The disciples saw that prayer was the power of Jesus' ministry. And that before Jesus did anything, he went and prayed and talked to his father about it. And then when he came back out in the public, whatever it was that he prayed about, uh, man, it just miracles happened. I mean, how many of you could take five loaves and two fishes and then pray a little blessing on them, and then break them into 12 pieces, give one to each of the disciples, piece of bread, piece of fish, and then said, all right, guys, all right, you go to get that group. All right, John, you get that group. You know, Philip, you get that group. Uh, Peter, that's yours right there. And he sends them to groups that have been people sitting in groups of people, and the disciples walk out there and they say, all right, guys, uh, I got a piece of bread and a fish. Let's, I mean, I wish I had enough for you, but let me, I'll just give, break it off a little piece and I'll give it to you. And then they start breaking them and the fish never runs out and the bread never runs out. 
and everybody eats as much as they want to eat. And there were 5,000 men, much less the women and children, maybe 15,000, maybe more. And they break them and they never run. And then at the end, they pick up 12 take-home baskets, one for each of the disciples. Now, that's, that's power after prayer. And Jesus said, look, you know what prayer's about? It's about what you do when nobody sees you. It's not about, oh, look, we know how you look in the spotlight. We know how you look when the light is shining on you. But your heart will be revealed to you in the darkness of the prayer closet. That's where God sees your heart. So enter into, separate yourself. Don't try to talk Jesus into something. So Jesus is teaching them how to pray. Look, he had to teach, they needed to learn how to pray. We need to learn how to pray. And Jesus says, here's how you do it. All right, here's the second uh, instruction, second mindset. Talk to God as you would your parent. All right? Um, This is the first thing he wants you to know when you pray is who he is. He start, and this is the, the sentence. How do you start your prayer? Our Father. So who is he? He is our Father. Everybody say parenthood. Parenthood, all right. So all of you in this building right now know me as your pastor. Uh, I hope you know me as a friend and your pastor, but that's not my point. My point is there's one person in this room who knows me as daddy. Of course, Holly gets to be daddy too, but by proxy. But Justin knows me by daddy. When you guys talk to me, you're talking to your pastor. When he talks to me, he's talking to his daddy. Now I'm his pastor, but first I'm his daddy. And there's one thing that we all know about parenthood, because most of us in here are parents, and that is that when you're a parent, what you want for your children is you want all of the blessings that you have and all of the stuff that you have for them to have the same thing, to have all of it. In other words, there's nothing that I have as a parent or Tanya and I as a parent that Justin couldn't get because we want him to have all of our stuff. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because when you go to the Father knowing who he is, that he is your Father, and what he wants for you is he wants you to have all the same stuff that he has. So when I go to him, I address him as my Father. I mean, he's not some sacred head of our denomination. He's not bishop so-and-so. He's not doctor so-and-so. He's not elder so-and-so. He's not rabbi so-and-so. I mean, he's just, he's just daddy. What does the scripture say? We call him Abba. You know what Abba means? Abba means daddy. It means a, a very intimate, close uh, word for an intimate relationship. So once you understand parenthood, you understand that this is what God wants for us daily. Not, not just seasonally, not just at some appropriate time, but this is what he wants in our life daily, that we reflect his image, that we reflect his likeness, that, that his, his dominion, his power, his, I mean, that all of this is to be reflected out of our life because he is our daddy. All right, here's the third instruction. Recognize the line of authority. And I know that sounds real clinical, and you say, okay, authority, all right, well, All right, the first thing he wants you to know is who he is. He's our father. The second thing he wants you to know is where he is, which art in heaven. Now, what is true about heaven? Well, don't get all um, cognitive about it. Just think about where heaven is and what Jesus would be saying by our father, which art in heaven. Heaven is... Is, is up there. Heaven is above me. Heaven is over me. So what Jesus is trying to say to us in a very um, easy way is that we must recognize that he is over us. Everybody say position. All right, parenthood and now position. 
And God always works through authority. Uh, the scripture says, let everything be done decently and in order. And with God, there's always a head, and then everything flows down from the head to the body. If you have something with no head, what, you're dead. If you have something with two heads, you're a freak, all right? So we can't have two heads, and we gotta have a head, and God says, all right, I'm the head. I'm the one over you. And David gave us a wonderful picture of this. this uh, it's in Psalm 133. Look at it. Uh, here's what David said. This is how it looks. I mean, so we can imagine what, what he's talking about. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, who's the high priest, by the way, running down on the edge of his garments. This is a picture of, of authority and how it comes down from the head. Uh, Aaron is the high priest, and I know that, that uh, when you think about anointing, you're probably thinking about a little vial of oil, and you take your fingertip and you tip it in there and you put it, you know, just a little tip here, a little tip where, wherever you might be anointing. But anointing in the Old Testament and even in the New and even in Israel today, anointing, they took a flask of oil. I mean, something maybe, you know, about half of this size right here. They broke the top off of it. And then they just took it and they just poured it on you. And it just, I mean, it ran down. They anointed Aaron, the high priest, and that oil just ran down his hair, ran down on his beard, ran down, got on his robe, ran down his robe, ran all the way to the bottom of his robe. And the little uh, subjugate priest would be down there at the base of his robe trying to catch the oil and, and put it on themselves because everything happens in a line of authority with God. Heaven is God's throne, the earth is his footstool. I mean, you know, he's over us. And so Jesus said, look, uh, remember when you're praying, that you're praying to someone that is over you. I mean, pray with a sense of humility that you are talking to someone who is the head and, and, and he's not, he's, you know, he, he's not your business partner. He's not your co-pilot. I don't care how many people stick it on their car. He's not equal with you. He is over, he is over you. And, and, and so we pray with that kind of uh, attitude about our relationship with him. And, and we pray with that amount of humility in there that he is over us. And we do this daily. We don't just do it on Sunday when it's convenient to do it. This is the way we pray every day with that line of authority. Uh, come in, you don't just come in and sing and shout and spin and buck and all that kind of stuff and then walk out and say, whoo, man, I'm glad that's over with. Yeah, we'll put that on the shelf until next week. No, I mean, this is, this is daily we do this. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, and then the fourth instruction he gives is praise him. I know we do that, but just to give you a little word about it, in verse nine, he says, uh, our Father who art in heaven, and here comes hallowed be your name, oh, unless you're Baptist and it's hallowed. We always say hallowed be, hallowed be your name. Uh, but hallowed, it just means <clears throat> honored. It means exalted. It means uh, Praised. It means worshiped. It, it means you're the, you're the, you know, we honor you and how we deal with you. So the first step that Jesus said is that he wants for us is to know who he is. So who is he? He's daddy. To know where he is. Where is he? He's over us. And now the third step is to praise him for who he is <laughs> and where he is. And, and, and God, and, and, and this is daily. This is not when, just when the bills arrive or when the children get in trouble at school or when we're really in a tight or our job is on the line or whatever. My, you know, this, is, this is daily, this is what we do. And here's the fifth instruction. Acknowledge his purpose. Here's his purpose in verse 10. Your kingdom come and your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This means if you're, if you're sitting here and you're waiting on something to happen that's gonna happen one day, the Bible says, and he's gonna come and get you and he's gonna take you home with him 
and you're going to get to see his kingdom and you're going to get to be a part of his kingdom, then you are missing the purpose of God on this earth. God has a kingdom. He has a king and he has a kingdom and this kingdom is on this earth. This kingdom is now. This kingdom is what we represent. It's what we're part of. His purpose is for the kingdom to be spread, for the kingdom to be expanded, for us to reach people and carry people to heaven with us that won't get to go to heaven if somebody doesn't tell them about the kingdom and about the king. And so we pray that his will would be done, his kingdom would come, his will would be done on earth just like it is in heaven. And of course, in heaven, how is it done? Perfectly done. So his kingdom is what we pray for and the kingdom can exist right now and we're part of the kingdom. We're not waiting for his kingdom to come. Now, I I know in these days that we're living in, these are some terribly difficult days. And these are days where everyone who is spiritual senses the same thing. We all sense that the end is near. (laughs) I'm not trying to be a pessimist about this. But, well, you do know heaven's better than this, right? Right? Okay. So uh, one of these days we're going to get to go to heaven. One of these days Jesus is going to split the sky and and, and we're going to be gone from here. And we believe that this will be soon. We sense that. I mean, we just have that sense about it. And you see the craziness of the world and the lunacy of everything. And you just say, how long could that last, you know? And you'll find yourself, if you're not careful, waiting for something. Like, I'm I'm waiting so I can be a part of his kingdom. But just know that no matter what's happening here, if you belong to him, you're part of his kingdom. And so he says, when you pray, acknowledge that, his purpose, that you're part of his purpose. And then let me give you this last one. And it's, it's, it's probably the most critical of all. And that is, ask for your comfort zone to be shaken. All right, every one of us have comfort zones, right? We have places where we are comfortable. Things happen in the comfort zone that we're used to. They are normal for us, and we like things to be normal. We don't like it when things get out of whack. We say we do. I mean, I can't tell you seriously how many churches... (laughs) And I know I sound like I'm down on churches, but I'm not. Churches are just people, and people are crazy is all it boils down to. If it wasn't for people, boy, the ministry would be a lot of fun. I'm serious. You. But uh, I've been in them, and, and, you know, and many of them, many of them say, uh, Pastor, uh, if you come here, you know, to, to uh, pastor us, or uh, we won't change. We don't want to be the same. We've been the same way for 75 years, and we don't want to be that way anymore. We want to be warm. We want to be uh, welcoming. We want to, you know, we want to have a little enthusiasm and excitement, you know. And that's what they say until you start making it warmer. Uh, more uh, uh, joyful and lightning. I tell you what, one time, and, and I'm not talking about anybody by name, but one time in one church, I had, I had to almost, um, I, I started to say fight, but I don't want you to give that connotation, but it was just a real ruckus in the, in the deacon's meeting one time because we were shaking hands when we welcomed the visitors. Seriously. I mean, can you imagine something so, so, so trivial as that? Like, okay, we're going to try to make our visitors feel welcome by shaking their hands and smiling at them and saying, we're glad to have you today, rather than just saying, all right, pastor said, all right, everybody's welcome in church today. We're so glad to have you. Raise your hand. We'll give you a card. And then that's it. No interaction, no nothing. It just makes it light. It makes the place warmer and friendlier and all of that kind of stuff. But I declare, it, well, you would have thought that it was the mark of the beast or something that we were doing. And also, one, I had another church that we almost had a falling out because we started clapping to welcome the visitors. Like, we'd like to have our visitors here today. Thank you. Raise your hand. Yeah. All right, everybody, let's make our visitors welcome. Man, no, 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 no. We don't clap in church. That's what they do at the honky-tonk down there. So we all 
talk about change, and we all act like we want to change. But most of the time, when we get change, we don't like change because we like it the way it is, because we're used to the way it is, and it's comfortable <laughs> the way that it is. But let me tell you, change is inevitable. You know what inevitable means? I sure you do. It means it's going to happen. <laughs> That's what it means. It's like death. Death is inevitable. Uh, paying taxes is inevitable. <laughs> You're gonna, it's going to happen. Well, change is going to happen. And, and what Jesus is saying is, all right, look, when you pray, you need to recognize that God is going to change things in your life. And that change is coming, and it's going to sh- rattle your comfort zone. And he And this is what he means when he says in verse 11, you pray, give us this day our daily bread. Now that may not sound like God's challenging them, but that statement right there, you pray this. You say, Father, give me today my daily bread. What God is saying is, We're going to break the status quo. I'm challenging the status quo. Uh, I had a friend, every time I say that little phrase, I had a friend one time, he always said this when you said status quo. He always said, well, have you ever noticed that the status is not much to quo about? And he thought that was hilarious. And it is kind of comical. But, um, but you know, all of us have a status quo. So he's saying, all right, we're going to challenge the status quo in your life. And so God... He's saying, look, I have, I have new bread for you. I have today's bread for you. I got new bread, and, and guess what? It, it's, it's every day I have new bread for you. We get all comfortable with how things are and how they've always been, and God says, no, 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 look, look, look don't get used to yesterday's bread. Pray every day for new bread because new bread is changing. Like, you remember the Exodus? Now, this is where uh, I mentioned I'd talk about the Exodus. You, you remember the Exodus and you remember what happened, right? And right at the start of it. God delivers them, Moses is leading them. They go through the Red Sea. They get in the desert on the other side and they don't have anything to eat. And they're all starving. They're all, you know, crying about and give them something to eat. And so God tells Moses that he's going to send them manna every day and that this will sustain their life. Now, the word manna means what is it? So when you hear that God said, I'm going to give you manna, that's not the word God used. That's what the people said when they saw it. I mean, when they, when they opened that tent flap that morning and they looked out there and they saw that stuff all over the ground, I don't know what it looked like. I kind of, I mean, I'm thinking of it like that, uh, what is that real airy little cake? Angel food cake. I'm thinking of manna like angel food. That's, that's what I'm picturing in my mind. Like a, maybe a spider web that kind of had a little texture like angel food and tastes about like angel food. No, no sweetness, no saltiness. It's bland. It tastes like nothing. And they didn't know what to call it. So when they looked out and saw it, they said, manna, which means, what is it? You know? and, they, and then you remember what happened, right? The first thing they did is, is Papa looked out the tent. He said, he said son, get the bucket. Uh, daughter, get the bucket. Mama, get the bucket. All right, where are we going, Daddy? Well, we're going out here, and we're going to scrape up all this stuff off the ground out here, and we're going to bring it back in our tent so that we'll have Plenty to eat for tomorrow and the rest of the week. And, you know, we're going to gather us up as much as we possibly can. And we're going to bring it back in the tent so it, we can take care of it because we're going to need it in the future. Now, why did they do that? Because they were used to the way it was. The way it was is you have to take advantage and get the food while it's there or else it might not be there anymore. So they couldn't even fathom the thought that this was going to happen every day. (laughs) This was not just a one-time event, but see, they they were so hooked to the past that they just couldn't fathom a, a, a future where they didn't have to struggle to get their food. So they went out and they... And they and they'd scoop it up and they and they gather it in and um, 
and, and try, to, uh, try to save it. And, and you know, the thing that amazes me is God says, look, I'm taking you to a land. This was God's promise when he took him out of there. He said, I'm taking you to a land that flows with milk and honey. Now, think about the contrast. They're on their way to a land. God says, I'm taking you to a land that flows with milk and honey. I mean, it's the most exciting, wonderful provisions you've ever seen. And they're sitting here wanting to collect this stale, tasteless, um, whatever it was, that was on the ground. Now, manna would keep you alive, but it, it certainly didn't have any flavor. I mean, you couldn't even put barbecue sauce on it or anything. It just was horribly bland. And there, instead, instead of saying, okay, God, uh, we're, we're ready for the milk and honey, they, they start scooping up all of the manna that's there. And you know what, what happened? What happened was when they, when they scooped the manna up, they put it in a bucket and they took it inside to their house. They found out real quick that overnight, this manna would spoil. So it didn't matter how much of it you put up, it wasn't going to be good the next day. So God let it spoil overnight. And why in the world would God let it spoil overnight? Because God wanted to teach them that when they wake up every day, and they throw open that tent flap every day, that they will be anticipating what is on the outside of the tent more than what is on the inside of the tent. In other words, God was going to do this every day, and you can't depend on what happened yesterday because what happened yesterday is no good anymore. So really, God is teaching a lesson. Look, you're, you're going to need to go outside yourself. Because see, what, what our lives get to be about, if we're not real careful, is it's all about me. I mean, what I can provide for myself, what I can get on my own, how I can take care of the needs of my life, how I can sustain myself. And so what God was teaching them in this manna routine was, look, I want to teach you and I want to make sure you understand that this journey that we're on toward your promised land is not all about what you can provide for yourself because you're never going to be able to provide sustenance for your own life so it's, you got to learn that it's not about what you can do for yourself. It's about what I can do for you. And so God teaches them that by sending them manna, and it happened every day. And, and, and he said, it learned to trust me. Now, what is his daily bread? Because I've said, all right, here's the point. Uh, pray, give me this day uh, my daily bread. So what? does your daily bread mean? Well, the traditional understanding of daily bread is uh, the word, God's word. And, and I understand why people really think that. And, they, and it's not a bad thought. It, it, it's, uh, God does give us his word every day. But if, this, if, this, if that was totally true, if that was just the total meaning of what it was, it'd be saying, all right, God, what we need to pray every day is we need to pray for you to give us a word every day, which would be a wonderful thing. We all get words from the Lord, and the Lord's given us his word, and we read the word, and we get inspired by the word. So we get his word every day. But let me give you, a, let me give you another thought about this daily bread stuff. And I, to do so, I want to take you to an incident that happened when Moses sent out some spies to look at the promised land. And the spies come back with their report. Listen to it. Numbers 13, verse 26. Now they departed and they came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. I mean, they brought back bananas and grapes and pomegranates. I mean, they were so big, they had, to, they had to take two men and they hung them on a, on a post and carried them. I mean, that, 
That's how fruitful the land was. And they brought back the fruit of the land and they showed the people. And then verse 27, then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey and this is his fruit. So the people go back with the report. Uh, God didn't lie to us. That is a land like you've never seen before. It flows with milk and honey, and we brought back all this fruit just to show you how wonderful this land is. So I, I've always been amazed at that, at, at how, how people could bring back the fruit and see how amazing it is and then decide that they didn't want to go there. That's always been puzzling to me. And, and, and you know, that happens a lot in life. God can do something tremendous in our lives that just blow our mind. I mean, he does miracles in our life. And then two or three days later, we're right back to the same old place where we started from. We always say we would never do that. I know many of us say, man, if I saw the Red Sea part, I would never be the same again. I don't know how they walked through that Red Sea and saw that, and then they did question God about anything. But it's very obvious, and we do the same thing. God works in our lives in so many ways. Oh, thank you, God, oh, that's a wonderful miracle. And two or three days later, we write back to the same old stuff we always have been in. But anyway, so they bring it back. And uh, then verse 28, nevertheless, did I put the word but in there? Yeah, I did. I inserted the word but, because that's what nevertheless means. It means we got all this fruit, everything, but. It always, but always changes things, right? But the people who dwell there in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. So God didn't lie to us. Everything God said was right, but there's one thing God didn't tell us. This land is occupied. There are giants <laughs> in, this, in this land. And so they're afraid, they're fearful to go in. And I, you know, a lot of times fear keeps us from going to our blessing. But let's go on. Verse 29. The Amalek, oh yeah, these kites, these I, The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Uh, you're going to have lots of ites in, in your fighting you for your promise. Uh, jealousites, uh, think of another one, uh, murmurites, uh, enviites, you know. I mean, you'll have a lot of ites in, 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 when you're headed toward where God would have you to go that you're going to have to deal with. So verse 30, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. So that's the that's the minority report. There were two of them on the minority report, Joshua and Caleb. There were 10 on the majority report that said they're giants in the land. We might not need to go up there. Verse 20, so let's go down to Numbers 14, the next chapter. Just Here's kind of the conclusion of, of what, what I want to say to you. Verse 6, but Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. So they get so upset with what the 10 are saying that they just get beside themselves. They just get outraged and they just, you know, they start yelling and tearing their clothes up. And, and here's what they say, verse seven. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel saying, the land we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Verse nine, only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them and the Lord is with us, so do not fear them. The little phrase, for they are our bread. What is the Lord saying by that? He's saying that whatever it is that comes against you, 
whatever it is that hinders you, whatever it is that causes stress in your life, whatever it is that is a, 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 a struggle in your life, that God allows those things in our life to make us strong, to nourish us, to sustain us, to be bread in our life. So when we face these difficult times, these changing circumstances, these changing issues of life, as we grow and move and go with God, and God is maturing us, and God is, 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 is changing us, and God is challenging us in life, that when we pray every day, we pray for those things that discomfort our life, that bring fear into our life and challenge into our life and, and, and uh, conflict into our life and those things that we struggle against because those are the things in life that nourish us, that strengthen us, that are our bread in life. What is bread, what is bread for? What does bread represent? What is bread? Well, bread is the, is the food of life. Have you ever noticed this? The first thing that happens anytime there's this, any kind of tremendous something and people are starving to death and all this kind of stuff, what is the first thing that we send in? Wheat, we parachute it in. Why? Because it's used to make bread. Why? Because bread sustains life and it's the first nourishment. So God says, man, <laughs> that's what one, one I'm trying to break in. So anyway, that's what sustains our life. So God is saying, when we pray, give us this day our daily bread. He's saying, pray for change. Pray for things that challenge you. And remember, God's got it bread daily in your life. Every day, there's new bread. The bigger the problem, the bigger the loaf. And so God says, pray that every day. All right, let's bow our head. We'll love you.